Good evening. Uh, for this evening's uh, lesson, we want to look at uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 through 11, is where we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 8, 7 through 11, and we're going to talk about the two covenants tonight. The two covenants in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 through 11. It says, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for the second. Because finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their father in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of the Egypt. Because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I make with, you, with the house of Israel after the, those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I remember no more. And then he says, I, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. And so this evening we just want to give a snapshot into the two covenants and talk about that a little bit. And we want to look at the characteristics of the covenants. Uh, and so there's so much dialogue you could do with this, but just for the Bible study lesson, I want to break it down just a little bit. So when we talk about the characteristics of the two covenants, uh, let's look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, Look at verse number 17. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus. And so when we talk about the law, the, the covenants, the first covenant, there was a law, the Ten Commandments. The laws came through Moses. But then uh, after that, the new covenant came through Jesus, the law of grace and truth. So we don't live by the Ten Commandments. We don't live by the old law. Uh, the old law died on the cross. And, and so we live in a new covenant with Jesus. And one thing about a covenant is, is, an, is an agreement. And so we talk about an agreement between man and God. And so when you talk about this in Hebrews, that's why God said they did not stay with the agreement. They did not stay with what it was I set up. And so we see where he says the first law came through Moses. But turn back to Hebrews. I want you to see that again. If you turn back to Hebrews uh, chapter 8. But we started that. Let me get over there. So watch again what he says. For if, if the first covenant had been faultless, then th there no place would have been sought for a second. So because the first covenant was not faultless, because the first covenant had some issues, God says, that's why I had to create a second. He goes on to say, because the finding fault in them, he said, behold, the days are coming, said the Lord, when I make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And look at verse number nine, that's what I wanna show you. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant and disregarded them, says the Lord. So he's talking about that, that he gave that covenant to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then they came out of Egypt, and as their fathers came out of Egypt and went into the wilderness, that how they did not keep the covenant, the agreements. And so God said, I'm going to bring another one in, which is started with Moses, when Moses gave the law from Mount Sinai. And so from that point on, 
they began to disregard the covenant, the agreement set up between them and God. So look at Hebrews chapter 10. Some characteristics of this covenant. Hebrews chapter 10. So the first covenant, we see it was given by Moses. So it was given by man, not by God himself. The second, think about this covenant. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 1. For the law having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continue year by year, make those who approach perfect. So he, he telling us here that the law, the old covenant, the old covenant law was a shadow of the new covenant, of the new things to come. It was a shadow. And if you didn't know anything about a shadow, a shadow has to have an image. And so the image of Christ is there, but the shadow of the covenant is there. And it wasn't until Christ brought the new covenant in, the New Testament, when he died on the cross to bring the New Testament, the will and testament. You can't have a will without a death. The, the will doesn't come into effect until a death takes place. So when Christ died, that new will came into effect, took place. But in the new will coming in, to, taking place, the new covenant came in and did agreement. A new agreement came in with that new law, that new testament. And so he's saying here, the old law was just a shadow. It was just a shadow. It wasn't the actual image. That's a characteristic of it. Another characteristic of it is Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. Let's look at that. Galatians 3 and verse 24. Galatians 3.24 Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But the faith has come we are no longer under the tutor. So let's, let's, look at verse, let's go back up to verse number 19 and read this whole thing to keep it in context. And watch what he says. Galatians 3 verse 19 <laughs> What purpose then does the law serve? So that was a question they asked him because at this time they're thinking they're under the old law. Paul is teaching them and letting them understand they're not under the old law anymore. And they're saying, well, what question, what purpose did the old law, law serve? It was added because of the transgressions to the seed should come, who, who the promise was made and it was appointed through the angels by the hand of the mediator. So he's saying the old law was only brought in because y'all couldn't, because y'all's transgressions, because things y'all were doing. So God put a law in place. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt have only one God. All these things. Now understanding that even with the Ten Commandments, in Matthew, Jesus gave some commandments, and, and he said some that, that are similar to the Ten Commandments, but they're not identical to all the Ten Commandments. He said, so, the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the uh, hand of the mediator. Now, mediator does not mediate for one, but for but God is one. Is the law against the promises of, this, of the God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given, when, when could have given life, truly righteous would have been given the law. And then verse 23, let's skip that to verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for faith, which, which would afterward be reward, revealed. Therefore, the law was not our, was our tutor to bring us to Christ. So the law was teaching them to Christ. Now, when we think about the two covenants and we think about the two testaments and the Old Testament, New Testament, we think about the two covenants, the covenant with Moses, the covenant with Christ, uh, the covenant with Moses, was the law was given by Moses. Under that law, they have something that you find out in, in Hebrews when God talks about it. They have something called the Day of Atonement. And then the Day of Atonement under that law, what happened was the priests would have to go in and wash themselves and they would roll 
the people's sins forward. This is what he's saying. Every picture that was there was pointing towards Jesus. So in the old covenant, they, they look forward to the cross. In the new covenant, we look back at the cross. And that's where we meet, at the cross. And so the old covenant was a tutor. It was a schoolmaster. It was teaching them about Christ, teaching them about Christ. Until Christ came and now you no longer need that tutor. Now you no longer need that schoolmaster. And so the old covenant is gone away. So anyone that tries to say we're still under the old covenant is mistaken. There's another characteristic of it. Romans 3 verse 20. Let's look at that. Romans 3 and 20. says therefore my deeds of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight for by the law is the knowledge of sin and so that's how God brought that in the law could not justify the law could not justify sin as I just talked about the day of atonement they sin would roll forward every year the priest would go in every year and roll their sins forward for the next year to the next coming year the law could not wash away sins. The law could not justify. And so we understand the law couldn't justify. It took Jesus coming in and understanding that it was only through him that things could be done. So let's look at a couple of things now. So, so this first covenant, is it binding today on us? Is it, is it binding on us today? Let's look at Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians 2. We're going to look at verse number 14. For you, brethren, become imitators of the churches of God, which are Judea and Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as did before Judea. Whom kill. Um, let me look at something here. I know. Make sure if I want to go. Oh, I'm in the wrong chapter. My fault. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Uh, let's go to verse 13 and pick it up there. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. And you being dead in your trespasses, the uncircumcision of flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses. So again, the law couldn't forgive the trespasses, but Jesus could. Verse 14, having wiped out the handwriting requirements that was against us, which is contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So are we still binded by the first covenant? Are we still having to follow the first covenant? No, it was nailed to the cross. It was nailed to the cross. And so we no longer have to, a bind is there, it was blotted out. He took it away. We're no longer under that schoolmaster we talked about in Galatians 25, 3.25. We no longer need that schoolmaster. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, look at verse number 11. Second Corinthians 3, 11. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. So what is he saying? The old law is passing away. The old law is done away with. And so when we talk about that, and we talk about the covenant, Understanding that that law is done away with. Romans 15 and 4 tells us things written before time were written for our learning. That through the patience and comfort of scripture we may have hope. But we understand that we're no longer under this bound to this law. Hebrews chapter 7. Let's see what else it says about this old law. Hebrews chapter 7. 
verse number uh, 18. Hebrews 7, verse 18. For on the one hand, there is a angular of the former commandment because of weakness and improbableness. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is a bringing in and a better hope through which we draw near God. Look what it says. The law, in verse number nine, 19, the law made nothing perfect. The law made nothing perfect. The law completed nothing. It was just that shadow. It was just that appearing. And so God moved it away. Understanding it was done annually, and now that's gone away with. They didn't annually have to do this anymore. They didn't annually have to roll their sins forward anymore. Now we sin, we can ask God to forgive us for our sins right then. We don't have to go to no one else. We don't have to wait for a high priest. And then as we said in Hebrews 10 and 9, we read that. Hebrews chapter 10. Verse number 9, then it said, Behold, I have come to, to your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. By that will we have been sacrificed through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So he says, I come. He says, God is taking away. He's talking about animal sacrifices and things. He's taking away the first that he may do better with the second. He says, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of, of Jesus Christ. Or verse number nine, I'm sorry. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first to establish the second. So once again, the two covenants can't run together at the same time. He takes away the first to establish the second. So it's taken away. So when we look at being taken away, this is a key. When we look at what's been taken away, instrumental music in the worship was taken away. When we look at Psalms 151 and David played the harp and played all these instruments and things, and, or he had the Levite, the time when you studied the Levite priest was the one that could come in and play the instruments. And they would play the instrumental music. And Amos, God says, and one day this noise is gonna be taken out of my ear. God tolerated music in the Old Testament. He tolerated it, but he said one day it's going to be removed. So music and worship. Not only that, the Sabbath day was done away with. In the Old Testament, under that covenant, God said, keep this, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Well, we no longer remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. We remember the Lord's day, the first day of the week, the day that Jesus rose on. So it's important to understand that when the law went away, a lot of things in that law went away that we're not bound to now, that we don't follow now. And then thirdly, uh, following up with this, uh, characteristics of the new covenant, some of them. Hebrews 8 and 6, we read that. It's better than the old covenant. Just something better. Nothing profound. Nothing theological. It's just better. Now, there are theological components in it. There are some confined, com, some, 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 some tight-knit things in it. But overall, it's just better than what, what they had. We live under a better covenant. We live under a better law. We live under a law of grace now. The old law wasn't about grace. It was about an eye for an eye, two for a two. The old law was about stoning kids and stoning children. They could not keep the old law. And so now we under the law where God gives us grace. That's why they say it's in Romans. Romans chapter 6. When they figured this out. Romans 6, 1 through 4. They said, what? We get grace every time we sin now? We get some of God's grace because when we sin, justification says kill them for the wages of sin or death, Romans 10, 23. But justification, grace says don't kill them. 
Yeah, you justified and kill them, but don't kill them. Grace says, give them mercy. Let them live. They figured it out in Romans chapter 6 and said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Shall we keep sinning to get more of God's grace? Paul says, certainly not, God forbid. For how many of us that live in sin have died to sin? And so it's a death, it's a burial. And we shouldn't live in that. So they couldn't keep the law, but we under a new law, it's just better. It's just better. And then look at finally Hebrews 10 and 10, which we just read a while ago. That will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never be taken away. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, wait until his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected for every, for, forever those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnessed to us. For after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. In our conclusion, we understand that the priest rolled sins forward, never had the ability to forgive sins. They had animal sacrifices they would use and then we find that Jesus became the ultimate sacrifice. One man died for all the sins of the world. And now because he did that, we no longer have to wait for someone to offer forgiveness for our sins. We can go to God ourselves. We are on royal priesthood now. We can cleanse ourselves and go before God and ask God to forgive us and be a mediator for ourselves to God. Knowing that Jesus is the ultimate mediator between us and God. All because he sacrificed. And in sacrificing, what did he do? He sanctified us. Sanctified, that word meant he set us apart. So I want you to know and I want you to be encouraged this evening that you are set apart if you're a child of God. We're supposed to be different. The Bible said we are peculiar people. We're different. We're supposed to be different people because we understand what God did for us in our lives. We understand the sacrifice he made. We understand the sacrifice Christ made. We understand that he brought a new covenant in and did away with the old covenant that even the forefather, even the people before us could not keep. Thank God this evening for the new covenant. May God bless you. May God keep you. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for this day and your blessings, Lord. We ask and pray that you be with us, guide us and lead us. We pray and ask you, Lord God, that through everything that we do, everything that we are, that you give us, we give you the honor and the glory. Father God, we pray that you'll forgive us for our sins. We pray, Lord, that your grace and your mercy will rest and rule in our lives until the next time we meet. For this our prayer, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.